Hey folks, how you doing? Doing good? Good. So it's spring here in Northeast Oregon. I'm hiding underneath the linden tree because it's like 80 degrees out and my pale ass burns. I just, I just burn. I don't tan or anything. I freckle more, but the freckles never really, I mean, they get thick enough that people think I have dirt on me, <laughs> but they're never like, they don't give me any protection from the sun. So I'm hiding under the linden tree and she doesn't mind. Um, today, I wanna talk to you all about random tincture facts and questions I get pretty often. Now, this video isn't gonna be about how to make a tincture, so make sure to go and check out all of my other videos that I have um, here on YouTube or on Instagram, whichever you're watching, you can find a ton on either or. Um, so I kind of try to make my, my tincture videos are pretty simple. I try to cover most things, but some people still have, you know, questions here and there and I just thought I'd make one place to send y'all to to get these answers. So I've got myself a quart jar of yarrow tincture here. Um, one of the common questions that I get is, did my tincture go bad? You know, like you've poured 100 proof vodka over your fresh plant matter, you're all excited about it, life got carried away and you find this thing like six years later or a year later or whatever later and you're like, Oh my God, April, has it gone bad? Is it rotten? Well, here's the cool thing. Alcohol essentially never goes bad as long as it's stored in the correct conditions. So if your lid is tight and it was somewhere cool and dark and it's not rusted on the lid, you know, it's not like been there so long that it's like corroding through the metal or whatever container you have it in, um, you're just fine. The only way that this alcohol is going to go bad is if it's exposed to air for a long time. What happens is the alcohol content or the water content, it depends on the temperature difference, um, start evaporating off. So if you live somewhere really, really, really hot, like you're somewhere in like Arizona or something in like the lower elevations, and you leave your tincture like in a jar and it's not like on all the way, odds are good um, if it's getting really hot somewhere, the alcohol, um, I mean, the alcohol will evaporate off first or if you're somewhere like kind of like cooler it, the water might evaporate off first but then no matter which one goes first you end up with something that's not safe it's either not safe because there's no alcohol content and the water's gone rancid or it's not safe because there's no water content and the alcohol has gone extremely extremely potent and you don't you don't want to be ingesting that it defeats the purpose of why we're using 100 proof vodka in the first place that's a question I get pretty often too. You know, why use 100 proof vodka, which is 50% alcohol, 50% water, that's what 100 proof means, versus Everclear, which is like 190 to 195% um, alcohol, which means it's at best 10% water. And that water is the answer why. When you go through the process of like making a tincture with Everclear, you have to go through moderately complicated math to make this tincture now safe to consume. And the really, really hilarious and ironic thing is when herbalists say, you have to use Everclear and dried plant matter, and these are the ratios, and these are this, do you know what ratios they're getting back to? <laughs> the ratios that you're working really hard to do, you're trying to mimic fresh plant matter and 50-50, and 50% water, 50% alcohol, which is 100 proof vodka. So you do all these steps just to get to what I got by just dumping 100 proof vodka over plant matter that's fresh. You're done. There's no math involved. Um, another thing, I don't really get this question so much as I get kind of like accused of being touched in the head. <laughs> so I'm just, listen, I'm just saying that's the way people phrase it to me. They're like, oh my god, if you, I'm a certified herbalist by the way, no such thing in America, and if you are using fresh plant matter, your tincture isn't stable it's gonna be so watered down, it's like to 10, 20%, it's gonna go rotten and blah, 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 because you have to have 25% alcohol content in your tincture, or it's not shelf stable. But 25% above, again, it'll last forever. But here's the thing, they're like, if you use fresh plant matter, it'll water it down to 25% or lower. That'd be a real neat magic trick. So let me do some simple visual spatial math for you. Imagine, I have one quart of yarrow tincture, and it should be pretty easy to, yar to yarrow, <laughs> to imagine, because I'm holding it right here, but it is also pretty easy to yarrow too. Um, and I dumped um, a quart, which is four cups, of 100 proof vodka over it. 
cool not hard to imagine at all there's four quarts or there's four cups of 100 proof vodka in there so for this to turn into 25 percent alcohol by volume content meaning all of the liquid only has 25 percent in it i have to add four more cups of water because when you're watering down ratios that are even like that it's really really easy one cup of water to one cup of 100 proof vodka makes 25 percent alcohol volume so for me to get this down to what they think it will turn into because of the moisture in the plant it would have to be like it'd be a fucking magic trick like a legit magic trick because that yarrow that maybe four cups of yarrow maybe probably three in there because I don't like to really pack them tight it would have to expand and extract four cups of water <laughs> now I'm telling you right now, if somehow you are putting four cups of fresh plant matter into a quart jar and pouring 100 proof vodka over it and you end up with a half gallon of liquid, you have just solved, you've done the type of magic that have just solved like world drought. <laughs> if you can turn four cups of plant matter into four cups of solid liquid, like you better patent that shit because you're gonna make billions of dollars so but that's one thing that it always really makes me laugh because they're like you don't know this and that and you're giving people you know false information and their tinctures are watered down to the point that they're gonna go rot on their shelves and I'm like what's really happening here is that and I'm not even trying to like really judge somebody so much as like they get defensive because they've learned something out of some course that certified them in nothing or a book that doesn't allow them to like think for themselves or really even think like logically about it because all the people that are saying that fresh plant matter is watering down a tincture have just never worked with fresh plant matter and so like they're kind of just regurgitating the same false information over and over again because again uh, go ahead and prove that go ahead and prove that if you put a quart of vodka over a quart of fr fresh plant matter that it'll somehow jump to half a gallon seriously like please prove me wrong <laughs> okay all that stuff aside, and what's really funny is um, where I get that the most is on my YouTube channel. So that's probably why I'm like, let me just vomit this on to you. So, okay, let me move on, let me move on. That part probably pissed some people off. So the next thing I get people asking me about is like dosage, and they want to see me strain it. And so I've got this whole setup here and some little tips and tricks for you. Okay, so... <laughs> generally in my mind it's pretty simple when I say like after the six to eight to ten weeks or the three years that you forgot it you want to strain your tincture um, and I'm like just strain it but I realized that that might not be as simple to somebody who's like never just strained a tincture <laughs> so forgive me for that um, so basically what I'm gonna do here and just full disclaimer um, I make like metric tons well not metric tons but I make thousands of gallons of tinctures um, from fresh plant matter um, for my own personal company and I'm not here to sell you anything so I don't really do this method anymore I thought about showing you although a lot of you have probably seen here on my Instagram uh, if you're on Instagram anyhow how I'm pressing out and using a hydraulic press but I am still using one thing that's similar I'm still using um, a nylon nut milk bag. I'm not fucking making the name up. It's called a nut milk bag <laughs> And I'm like, I know that it's meant for like making milks and things like that, but like I'm like, oh man I don't know. I've got teenage kids and I kind of am just a big kid myself And so like when penis jokes pop up, it's funny to me So here's a nut milk bag and I really like these because they have really fine micron and they're usable again and again and again and unlike cotton you can sterilize them really easy. Um, and also, did you know that some people are allergic to cotton? Um, I know some people can be allergic to nylon, but this is food grade nylon and it tends to not, it's non-allergic reaction kind or whatever. And so, um, but any nut milk bag will do. Even a cotton one, if you're not like planning on like giving it to people or something. Clearly when I'm making things that I'm gonna sell or whatever, I've got gloves on and such. Um, and so, and a hairnet and it's not as romantic as it looks. <laughs> Um, so then you're gonna get yourself a canning funnel and you're gonna put it right over the top You're gonna take your tincture give it a little bit of shake if you want to you don't really have to but sometimes I like to because What happens is the plant matter kind of like 
lodges itself up top because it wants to float right and then you go to like pour out and it's just like <laughs> and you're like oh fuck and it got everywhere so just give it a little bit of a shake well and then basically you're just gonna dump it right through now i use a press because when I'm making tinctures, I want to make sure that I'm getting absolutely everything out of there. I don't really want to waste any of this plant ally and all the effort and, you know, the sacrifice of this plant's life. Um, but if you don't have a press, I'm not going to do it all. But you can just um, push your plant matter down into the nut milk bag. And, you know, you can wear gloves for this, depending on, I mean, I'm not, I don't work with, like, really dangerous plant allies. But there's definitely some if you're, like, working with something... Um, like for example, if you were making a golden seal tincture, which you shouldn't because it's really bad for you and she's endangered, you really wouldn't want your hands all over it. Um, or if you're like making this to give it to somebody, just throw a pair of gloves on. Um, but, and then I'm just going to squeeze it out. Now, one neat thing, if you are doing a good amount and you find yourself really, really, really into, um, pressing tinctures is you can buy yourself what's called like a, a fruit press or a wine press. They're on Amazon for like between like 30 to 50 bucks. I rocked one for years, like like blisters on my hands. My forearms were like hella ripped <laughs> because I had to twist this thing. And basically it's just like a press. It's just like a little pot with a spout in it. And it's got a handle that you twist down with a plate and it smashes it and everything comes out the bottom of the pot. Um, and that's really handy. But I've pretty much strained my tincture. Now, if you don't have a nut milk bag, you can use a muslin cloth, a cheese cloth. You could use a clean bandana if you wanted to. Although, I'd go for like a white bandana, not something that's dyed. Because if it's not been like around a long time and you haven't washed it a billion times, I worry that it could strip the dye out. Um, you could even use like a little mesh colander if you wanted to. Just the finer mesh, the better. And with those, if you end up with a little bit of plant matter in it, it's not a big deal. Now, the next thing that you could do, if it's just you using your tinctures, I want you to know that it's okay. It's okay if you just leave it like it is with the plant matter in it. Generally, the only time I start to strain small amounts like this, like the stuff that I make for myself personally, is if I'm pulling off to the point where the plant matter is sticking out of the jar, I might just remove some plant matter then or I'll filter it. And that's just because um, the plant matter that comes out of the jar, eventually the alcohol will evaporate off of it, like if it's just sticking up. Um, and you don't want that to like, it probably won't grow molds, honestly, because of the alcohol content, but generally just try to keep everything below the alcohol surface. Um, but you can keep it like that. And then one thing that people always ask me, like, what do I do after I've made this? Like, how in the hell do I, like, get, okay, so you strained it, but now what? Right, you strained it, but now what? Now you can bottle it up. So I see people, and there's nothing wrong with this, and you can go this route, especially if you, like, don't prefer to use plastic. I understand that. Um, I've seen people, they, they, forever, they're using those little tiny metal funnels. There's a train going by, forgive me. Um, they use those little tiny metal funnels, and they put it in the top of the tincture bottle, and they fucking painstakingly try to, um, as soon as the engine goes by, it'll quiet down, I promise. <laughs> um, they painstakingly try to pour the tincture into every bottle, and unless you start doing that for years at a time, you are gonna spill your tincture every time. Those little funnels suck, it takes forever, and you're like, ugh. Or, you could go buy yourself some of these sterile veterinarian um, syringes. These are food grade, these are alcohol safe, you can wash them, and you can use them again and again. So, the thing about plastics, as far as the environment goes, is, they do fuck up the environment, but the main way they fuck up the environment is the massive production because everybody's using things as single use. But plastic doesn't have to be single use unless you make it single use. So you could buy yourself like five or six of these syringes and you could honestly probably use them for the better part of like four or five years. And if you still don't like the idea of plastic, that's completely all right. But what you can do is get these that are made out of metal and stainless steel. They're not going to be cheap. You'll usually find them on like medical websites and such. Um, and they'll be like 30 to 50 plus dollars for one. But then it is, you know, not plastic. 
however they break really easy <laughs> I've had two I've broken both of them um, so basically if you're going to use one of these all you're gonna do okay one more thing <coughs> The main reason that I like these is because it shows the milliliter amount. I know that this is a 15 milliliter bottle and I know that that's 15 milliliters. So all I have to do is pull out 15 milliliters worth of liquid and I usually do a little bit less because you need to have room for your dropper to go in. So it's like 14 and a half, you know? just spilled my teacher bottle and I didn't spill a drop. I lied, the train didn't get quiet as it went by. <laughs> Between the wind and the train, at least a bunch of people are gonna tell me to buy a fancy microphone. And I understand, but I'll probably never do it because I like just making these videos pretty casual. So just like that, I have filled up my tincture bottle. Now I like these 15 mil bottles because they're easy. I can put them in my pocket, I can toss them into my purse, and now, that's an important one to me because I carry a lot of varying different types of tinctures on me. And if I start having the big bottles, what happens is um, I have a neck ache because my purse is so fucking heavy. So if I'm carrying like five or ten of these, it's only like the equivalent of like two and a half to like five big bottles, right? The weight difference isn't quite as bad. Um, so train's done. What's funny is we live pretty out in the middle of nowhere and the train's quite a bit down, but I'm like, well, you know, <sighs> I could not buy this property just because the train went by. And so we hear the kids who are teenagers, by the way, they're like, a choo-choo, a choo-choo. <laughs> when we first moved in, everyone was really excited about watching all the different trains go by. Anyhow, so it is really pretty easy to fill your tincture bottles with these um, food grade and alcohol safe veterinarian syringes. If you live anywhere where there's like a feed store or you have like livestock in your community, you can generally go to any type of feed and tax store and buy these like by the box if you want to for pretty cheap. They come pre-sterilized in all different sizes. Um, I generally like the ones that have the wider tip. This one has a pretty narrow tip. I do like the narrow tip for filling like little tiny bottles of like um, of oils and such, but the narrow, the wider tip sometimes make it easier to like fill the bottle faster. But these are pretty small bottles, so no big deal. So the next question I get asked constantly, like on a daily basis on my YouTube videos, is how much of it do I take? And a bunch of you probably hate me because I don't. Um, tell you how much to take <laughs> because here's the thing um tinctures aren't pharmaceutical medicine so like I can't say this yarrow tincture needs to be taken two to five times a day with food and like stay out of the sun right because there aren't all these FDA trials and all these things that are like this is exactly how it works but also um plant allies don't really they definitely don't work on our body the same way that pharmaceutical medicines do so I'm really hesitant to tell people like what exact dose to take because first of all um, it just doesn't work that way I'm not trying to give you direct medical advice and I really want you to build a relationship with any plant that you're working with and get curious and look around and say you know I don't know if that's the right dose for me but generally what I do when it comes to starting to take a tincture that I've never taken before is I take one drop. One drop. One drop and I consciously pay attention to how my body feels. And then if that plant in particular is safe to keep like going up in drop amounts, I'll work my way up to maybe 5, 10, 15, half a, dro half a dropper full. But again, it, if you are um, making a tincture for yourself, regardless if it's lemon balm or poke root, you need to take a few moments to say, well, what's the average dose for this? Just look online, be like, what are people saying the average dose is? And then I'm gonna start with the very smallest dose because I acknowledge that like every body is different. Like everybody's body is different. <laughs> That's a hard one to say, um, but it is. And so what might be okay for me might not work for you and what might work for you might fucking make somebody else feel like shit 
And so you've really got to cycle through and just get to know these plants. Um, another question that I get is, can I take a bunch of tinctures at the same time? The answer is yes, but wait a minute. It's yes if you have gotten to know each one of these plant allies on an individual basis. Like if you've been working with yarrow for like the better part of like two weeks to a month and you're like, I know how she feels in my body. Maybe you could take her alongside lemon balm and you're like, oh, okay, like now I'm taking it with lemon balm or whatever I want to add to it. Because the reason I want you to do that is if you took a yarrow tincture and you took a lemon balm tincture and you had a bad reaction, tell me how you know which one it's going to be. How do you know which one made you feel like shit? And on the flip side, how do you know which one helped you? So that's the reason that like I don't personally make or even advocate for making like mixed blend tinctures because let's say you buy a tincture and it's got like, it's not uncommon for most tinctures that herbalists crank out to have like three to six different types of plants in it, right? They're like, oh, this is the wellness elixir. That's cool. But like, what happens if you take the wellness elixir and you have like an anaphylactic shock or you feel really good, right? Now you're like, well, that's not a bad thing, but just fucking bear with me. How do you know which herb caused it? On the bad side, if you have a really like nasty reaction, how do you know which plant caused it and are you currently willing to go through taking every single one of these plants to figure out which one caused it? <laughs> and what happens if the second time it happens that like you get really ill? Like maybe the first time it was, like, oh, that was shitty, but then you take like a full tincture made out of it and you get real fucking sick. Like, you know, and so it's best to work with plant allies one at a time. And then once you get to know them, if you want to take three or four at the same time, just drop them into the same cup, right? You don't need to blend them together. Um, and then just to trail off here, another reason, because, you know, I ramble a lot. <laughs> another reason that I really, really don't like combination tinctures, especially if it's something that you're buying from somebody, because let's say that tincture, like, worked really well for you. Oh, I forgot that part, so I'm just gonna blend it all together. So if it worked really well for you, what if you didn't need to be taking all of those other herbs with it? What if it was just the one herb? And what if having to take all these other herbs was putting stress on your body? Again, how would you know which herb was making you feel good? And what happens when you run out of that tincture and you can't buy any more? That's a real bummer because you're really, really dependent on the person who's making it for you. And not that they wouldn't be happy to keep making it for you, but you kind of are like really disempowered in that. Like if you ever call home a yarrow tincture from me, you know that it's just a yarrow tincture. You don't have to wonder what ratio, what herb blend, is there more of that or more of this? Because sometimes when you make a tincture with combinations, you're not putting the same amount of everything in. And so even though you might look at the ingredients list and try to recreate it, you might not nail it because you don't know if they put, you know, maybe more Tulsi in that and less catnip or whatever. Um, and so generally I like to offer people single type tinctures only because it's, it, you know, if you want to call them home for me, that's fine. But also you're not, held like hostage to me having to make it for you. I encourage you. I encourage you to not need me. You know, by all means, I want you to learn to do this stuff because I know you're smart enough to do it and you don't need to be like held like hostage from people who are making you dependent on them. And I know that that will upset some people because I don't think every herbalist is doing that intentionally, but what we do unintentionally still affects people. Anyhow, so the next thing people ask me is, well, how do I actually take a tincture? Generally, I don't like to um, take a tincture in the way most people advise to because I feel it's really abrasive on our body. Most herbalists are going to tell you to take this yarrow tincture and put it directly under your tongue. Ouch! <laughs> Especially if they're telling you to use Everclear. Oh my god, that's going to burn so bad. It's called sublingual absorption. So like whatever you put under your tongue, it absorbs rapidly and it goes into your bloodstream like that. Um, but also if you're using Everclear, like, and even if you're using Hunter Proof Vodka, the membrane under your tongue is really, really sensitive and you can start doing that constantly. You can do some damage and I'd even argue that it might like increase your risk of mouth cancer because cancer is just a mutated cell and cells mutate when there's damage been done, being done. So if you're like constantly like bombarding it, I just, I wouldn't do it. You can just do this. 
you can put a little bit of water in a shot glass or some juice or whatever cup and then you can put however much you're going to take in your cup, give it a swirl, drink it down. It's not any less effective. Now, the only time that I do put tinctures directly under my tongue, that wasn't because of the taste, I'm actually thirsty. <laughs> um, the only time I do put tinctures directly under my tongue is if I need an immediate reaction because again, it's going to slam your bloodstream. So. Let's say, um, so technically I've had like a tiny bit of a stomach ache today from stress because <laughs> you know, life and you know, everything else that's going on right now. And, um, so taking tincture of yarrow uh, amongst all the things she does is she's like a carmative, a digestive aid. She's going to like help me get rid of farts. <laughs> so drinking her down that way is really great. But if I had, like, let's say a really bad bloody nose because she has natural styptic properties, which means to stop blood, um, I might put her directly under my tongue and like count to 30 and then drink it down because she's going to hit my bloodstream that much faster. But if I wasn't using it for something like that, there's no reason to. And so the same thing usually with Nervines, which is something that makes you like sleepy or calm or just mellow, like lemon balm, for example. If I I just wanted to have like a relaxing night's sleep I would probably just put some in some water and drink it down but if I was like maybe having an anxiety attack or something like that I would put the tincture directly under my tongue because I want it to hit me fast right so again um, it's nuanced you know I'm not saying never put it under your tongue but like ask yourself if you really need it to hit you like that in any given moment that you're taking it um, let me think of what else I haven't covered here. So I've shown you how to strain it. I've shown you how to take it, how to bottle it. I went off on a rant about why it's okay to use fresh plant matter. Um, someone's probably gonna be like, you forgot to talk about this and then I'll have to do another video. But tinctures um, are really, really ideal way to step into making um, plant offerings and plant medicines and things like that because it's really simple if you make it simple you don't have to follow all this complicated math if you're just working with fresh plant matter and a hundred proof vodka now I guess I could elaborate on that some because some people are gonna say some shit if I don't so why do I choose that oh motherfucker oh I thought it was a tick <laughs> it's been a tick season it was just a beetle still motherfucker get off my neck um, so the thing is that when you make i think he might have i don't know if he bit me or if it's just like the fear of it um if you make a tincture with dried plant matter and grain alcohol you are really 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 likely to have a bad reaction if you were going to have a bad reaction because so when you dry a plant all of her water soluble properties for the most part dissipate right and then what's left behind is her most volatile compounds which are called volatile organic compounds and it's what people strip out of her in massive amounts to make what they now the market deems essential oils <laughs> but they're also a really uh, uh, a really refined chemical so what happens when you use dried plant matter and um, grain alcohol which isn't made out of grain most of the time I mean it can be but it just refers to the really really high proof alcohol what happens is you're only extracting this plant's most volatile compounds and since there's no freaking water in that alcohol that you're using in any way shape or form you are missing a whole myriad of water soluble properties i mean and there's still some water soluble properties in dried plant matter but not all that much if i absolutely had to make a dried plant matter tincture um i'm gonna still use 100 proof vodka because I still want those water soluble properties in there and I'm not trying to use an alcohol that's so potent that if you leave it in there too long it will literally begin to degrade your plant matter into mush it's pretty crazy that's why when people make um, um, tinctures out of grain alcohol they're done in like two weeks average tincture that's made out of a hundred proof vodka needs to set for six to eight weeks but in that six to eight weeks you are getting all of her water soluble properties you're even getting some mineral soluble properties because you know water erodes minerals and all that kind of stuff but i don't want you to think that there's any nutritional content in a tincture because the amount is still minuscule it's like eating a slice of carrot like a single slice of carrot and thinking you've gotten a ton of vitamin a it doesn't really matter um 
but also you're getting these complex layers of how these water soluble and alcohol soluble properties are like interacting together so you may or may not know this but like you know like how um, sometimes if you take a vitamin supplement you can actually hurt yourself if you don't have another type of vitamin in your body. Like how like nature almost knew what she was doing and like if you eat a plant whole, it has all the nutrients you need in it, all the vitamins and minerals to like absorb that correctly. Well, I think of tinctures in the same way. We really need all these water soluble properties to balance out all of these volatile non like alcohol soluble properties. And it really, really, really just makes an excellent and smooth tincture that it doesn't act like a pharmaceutical drug. If you are the type of herbalist or you want to be the type of herbalist that wants to pretend like you're wearing a green lab coat, like you want like people to have like reactions and equate reactions with being healed and oh look what I did for you <laughs> again fuck I'm just too tired not to talk shit at this point sorry <laughs> um then go ahead and work with grain alcohol because what you're doing at that point in time is making something that's really really similar to a pharmaceutical drug it's not a pharmaceutical drug but it's really potent um and so I just if but if you're wanting okay let me take a breath <laughs> real human here gets riled up about shit that she's passionate about. If you're wanting to make a safe, simple plant type offering that is gentle and it's not really like ramrodding your body, I really suggest that you look into working with fresh plant matter and 100 proof vodka. And if you can't find 100 proof vodka, cause here's one that I always forget to answer and almost forgot to answer, it's okay to use 80 proof. 80 proof is just fine. Let it sit for a week or two longer. So instead of like six to eight weeks, go eight to 12 weeks. You know, probably up into 12 week range. That way you have just a little bit longer for the alcohol to absorb out what she's gonna absorb. Um, some people ask me like, what about, oh, here's some. I'm just pulling it up in my mind as I go along. Probably should have been organized and like written all this down and been like, stay on point. And here's my PowerPoint plan. <laughs> But you guys don't like that stuff and I don't like it either. So people ask me, can I make a tincture out of vinegar? Can I make a tincture out of honey? Can I make a tincture out of glycerin? And the answer is no, you can't. You can make these things, but if you make a tincture out of vinegar, it's just an herbal infused vinegar. It's not actually a tincture and you need to be taking it in larger doses. And it does have like, it'll go like rancid on you in about, mm, six months to a year um, and you can make a, an infused honey and that's not a tincture either and you can make a glycerin, a glycerin tincture and that's not a tincture either. Tinctures can only be made with alcohol by definition but you can if you don't want to consume alcohol and you want to use glycerin I need you to know that glycerin is like a type of alcohol and the, your body doesn't recognize it like any different other than your liver kind of has a hard time processing it and so like if you drink enough glycerin and please don't because it's actually kind of toxic um, if you drink enough vegetable glycerin what would happen is you'd first of all you'd shit yourself violently that's that's just gonna happen so brace yourself for that <laughs> and and the fact is, it um, it's going to give you all the same symptoms as if you drink a lot of alcohol minus the hangover because your liver can't really process it in the same way. So you're going to feel like shit, sluggish, not want to move, have a horrendous headache. Um, so you just don't, well, I should say I said that wrong. You just don't get drunk. Like you have all the symptoms of like getting drunk without ever like having that like really shit face feeling and so but you know you're not really taking that much in a tincture form but and it's okay to make those if you want to but they're not really they're not really tinctures and by the way once you make them whether it's fresh plant matter or if it's dried plant matter you've got at best three to six months before it goes rancid and please keep it in your fridge now if you want if you're making something like cbd you can blend a uh, tincture like well alcohol with glycerin that's okay. It'll help keep it shelf stable. You'll still get more of the, um, the alcohol soluble properties. Glycerin will make a tincture, but it will be very, very weak. Um, one thing you can do if you made a vinegar and you made a honey is you can mix them together and they call that an oxy mill. Um, that's really cool. It's just a sweet vinegar. And then you can get creative if you want and you could, and I'm just, again, 
drifting here. You can make uh, vinegar with alcohol and um, honey and make a spirited oxymel. I've never seen anybody else do those, but I started doing those. I mean, they might. I just, I haven't looked all that much, honestly. I started making those about five or six years ago, and I really like it. I really like it. Um, I take those tinctures um, in like a higher dose because, you know, there's not as much, it's not as potent. Um, hmm, just thinking. I'm also thinking that my video, like my phone, like might have died while I was making this video and I'm just talking to myself because that's happened before. <laughs> I had a little, I had almost a full battery when I started, so I hope not. But I think I've covered a lot of information there. I am sorry if I confused you. Feel free to drop, you know, questions in the comment sections. Um, I'll do my best to get back to you. I have a harder time on YouTube than I do on Instagram replying to comments. Um, but yeah, you know, and don't feel bad if you have to watch the video a time or two and like take notes because April like word vomited on you. <laughs> I mean, that's okay. But regardless, regardless, and regardless of how you even decide to try to make a tincture, even though I, I just, I really suggest you just stick with Hunter Proof Vodka and, and Fresh Plant Matter, I want you to know that you're smart enough to do this. It doesn't need to be as complicated as everybody wants you to believe it is. And they, you also don't need to pay somebody thousands of dollars to learn this. Because again, I cannot stress this enough, you are absolutely smart enough to do this, folks. You really are. I even believe to an extent that like this, these memories of like making medicines and things, they're in our DNA. You know, the pharmaceutical industry has really only been around for what, like, let's give it a generous 400 years, 500 years. But even then, like way back then, they were just like, if I cut you, it'd make you bleed a lot. <laughs> but prior to that, all of our ancestors, no matter where you are from, no matter what culture you are from, were working with these plant allies and had a really close land-based relationship. And so it's like, this is in your DNA. It's not even a matter of learning, it's a matter of remembering. Just remember and just start and just get busy and don't feel like you need to study for years before you try to make a tincture or a tea or an infused oil because the best way to learn is by doing. Um, and maybe you just need someone to tell you that you're smart enough because I know that we're all kind of like lacking that in life most of the time and the herbalism world is like really, really intimidating like from a lot of people that are like, I have this degree. Well, you don't have a degree in any way, but it's just, it's just important for me that you know that you're capable. So, okay, I'm gonna stop ranting now and um, I'll see you next time, bye.